All right, let's get started. Welcome to today's Smith in the World panel. My name is Heather DeLand and I'm the Career Specialist for Government, Law Policy, and International Affairs in the Lazarus Center. We welcome all who have taken the time to join us today, including students, prospective Smithies, faculty, staff, um, family, friends, supporters, supervisors, colleagues, and anyone who I may have left out. Thank you for joining us. This is the seventh and final panel of the 2024 Smith in the World Conference Series. Over the last six weeks, we have, we have had sessions on the topics of collaborative leadership design and innovation, health professions, business finance and consulting, arts, media, and communications, education, nonprofit, and social impact, and STEM. The Smith in the World Conference is intended to celebrate and share students off-campus experiential learning, including internships, community service, research, and study abroad. Our students will offer reflections on how these experiences have impacted and enriched their academic and professional paths. Today's topic is government, law, and public policy. Our three panelists will give short presentations about their off-campus learning experiences. I am honored to introduce our panelists. We have Rebecca Connor, who attended a variety of hearings at the DC Superior Court and published articles about the trials and the verdicts. Jackie Ochoa Acevedo participated in the Sonia and Selena Sotomayor Judicial Internship Program, where she shadowed and researched for Judge Vera Scanlon. Finally, we will hear from Koki Kapoor, who interned for Dynamic SRG, a progressive political fundraising, consulting, and public affairs firm. Today's session is being recorded, and we ask that all audience members please keep your microphones muted. After all of the panelists have presented, we will open it up for questions from the audience. We encourage you to submit your questions for the presenters using the Zoom chat feature. So with that, I will pass it over to our first panelist who is joining us from her study abroad this afternoon or late evening for her, Rebecca. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rebecca Connor and I'm currently a junior at Smith College studying government sociology uh, with a concentration in journalism. And so um, this past summer, um, as part of my concentration, I participated in an internship with an organization called DC Witness, um, and I'm going to tell you about that experience today. So uh, what is DC Witness? So the organization that I worked for is a nonprofit organization um, in the DC area. There's also a sister branch in Baltimore, and they're primarily focused on bringing awareness to the criminal justice system in the DC area. Um, specifically cases that aren't often highlighted in more major publications. So, you know, if you ever turn on the local news, you're probably seeing kind of a report of crimes that might have happened in your area that day. But unless something is seen as particularly interesting, it often doesn't get attention beyond that stage. And so part of the goal of this organization is to bring awareness of what happens after a crime has occurred and the steps that happen in the criminal justice system after that, both to bring light to what happens for the families and victims, as well as what happens for the defendants. Um, so primarily my work consisted of editorial work. And what that meant is that every day I was going to hearings at the DC Superior Court, which is essentially like the local court for um, the District of Columbia, Washington, DC. And I would sit in these hearings and I would listen to the judge speak. I would listen to the lawyers. Um, I would hear all the proceedings and I would research what was going to happen in these hearings in advance. And then I would write stories on them. So these stories were um, written for a variety of different reasons. We primarily covered um, homicides and non-fatal shootings because they're simply just, especially at the nonprofit level, aren't often enough resources to cover everything that needs to be covered. So we decided to focus on those specific um, felonies. But so that meant a lot of tough topics that we were dealing with and also led to a lot of cases where you can see the failings of the criminal justice system just as often as you can see the successes. Um, 
And I think that's one of the really important things that I learned from this internship was to try and look at every story from both sides, from both the victims and their family and the defendants, because a lot of times both groups are people who have had a really hard time and who have been disadvantaged. And so when you go into a courtroom, you really have to do so with a lot of empathy for everyone involved and a lot of understanding as often as possible, especially when you're writing stories and you're making the experiences and the most vulnerable moments of these people's lives available to the public, because that's essentially what I was doing as I was writing about some of the hardest days of these people's lives and putting them towards the public because it's important for the public to know about what crimes have happened in their area, um, just for public safety, but also to know how the criminal justice system works and for them to understand how their community is being made safer or not safer by the systems that are in place. Another aspect of um, my work that I did was data work. And so part of DC Witness's mission is to also track um, felonies that happen in the DC area. Um, a lot of times uh, law enforcement systems don't always have the best record keeping or the most accessible resources when it comes to tracking crime and um, other criminal justice issues in the area. And so one of the things that we did was every hearing, I would have to fill out a data form where I would say what had happened in that hearing, who was present, whether lawyers for the defense or the prosecution was there, was someone sentenced, was it a trial, what happened that day? And so keeping this information is important for us to kind of catalog what's going on in the city, as well as to make sure that we kind of have a record for when we're publishing these stories, that there's a way for us to back up what we're saying, right? You know, with responsible journalism, you always have to make sure that you're able to confirm what you're saying. And a lot of times, um, one of the things that I learned here is that public record systems are very difficult to use and they often don't have complete information. So a lot of the times the information that I was publishing in these stories was just from what I heard in the courtroom. It was not written down anywhere else. There was not a lot of record of it everywhere. Um, and so you have to take very detailed notes and be as accurate as possible because sometimes your notes and your word are the only thing backing up what you're saying and putting out into a public forum, which obviously can put the organization and you personally at a lot of risk. Um, and also with this data coverage, we try to use as many data points as possible to make sure that our coverage is unbiased. I mentioned earlier, like local news coverage of crimes can often focus around what's very sensationalized and what kind of seems most interesting to whoever decides to report the story. Um, and that can lead to biased coverage sometimes where um, certain factors are kind of upped uh, just to make things seem more interesting and appealing to the public. And so by collecting data thoroughly, we were able to make sure that everything was as unbiased as it possibly could be. And so why is this important? So specifically in the DC area, uh, I'm originally from the DC area and for many people, they see it as the nation's capital. It's where um, people go to work in Congress. It's where all these huge uh, lobbying organizations are. It's also a city that has a lot of problems, um, especially for communities of color. It's historically a very Black city. It has a high African-American population, and it's also historically a very segregated city. Um, and so this leads to a lot of issues because the segregation of the city has engendered a lot of gang violence as well. And so that was one of the things that I came across um, a lot when I was doing these stories was a lot of this violence that was caused by segregation and a lot of neglect in the community and community resources. DC often has a really strong um, school to prison pipeline system because there aren't a lot of resources in place for underserved communities. And so when you're writing stories about people who have committed crimes, especially with um, homicides and non-fatal shootings, these are often violent crimes. And so you don't want to downplay what has happened, but you also have to keep in mind the systems and the circumstances that have led to these events occurring, because a lot of times it is a failure of individuals, but it's also a failure of systems. Um, and so, like I wrote here, African Americans um, make up eight out of 10 arrests in the DC area, and they're only 45% of DC's population. So that's obviously incredibly disproportionate, and that has to do in large fact with these communities are incredibly over-policed. And so when you're reporting and you're a journalist talking about these things, it's something you have to keep in mind is, you know, you're writing these stories that are primarily about 
defendants who are people of color, but why, why is that? Is it because these people are committing more crimes or is it because they're being arrested more? Because those aren't the same thing. And so when you're writing um, public facing pieces about issues that are really sensitive, like the criminal justice system, you have to keep all these things in mind. And then when it comes to victims, it's really important to tell the stories of victims and their families, because a lot of times victims are known by the people who are harming them. And so you have to tell a story of a community that's been neglected or who has been harmed. And so you kind of have to make sure that you're telling the whole picture and seeing how the criminal justice system fully operates and the ways in which it can hurt victims further or hurt their families further than the harm that's already been done. So my role as an editorial intern, um, I mentioned earlier that I primarily um, attended hearings and trials at the DC Superior Court. Um, and then I would essentially spend the whole day at the court. I would take notes um, about what had happened in these hearings, and then I would write articles about them. So these articles were often relatively short. Um, hearings, they can last five minutes and they can last a whole day. It depends on what needs to happen. Um, I think one of the things that people don't always realize about the criminal justice system is that there's so much more than just trials and verdicts and sentence and sentencings. So you have all these hearings that happen in between the moment someone is arrested and the time that they get sentenced or the time that they get released. And those are also important to talk about because people don't know about them, because people don't understand the way that the system works a lot of the time. And so part of the goal of the organization was to make sure that this process is facing some level of transparency and the public is able to understand what's going on. And one of the other things that I found really interesting while I was here is a lot of times in these courtrooms, I was the only person there who was not a defendant, the judge or a lawyer. So there is no one who was really watching these proceedings a lot of time. And so public accountability is really important because we need to make sure that we're holding systems of power accountable and so one of the ways that you can do that is by being a court observer, which is part of what my job was, but it's something that anyone can do. A lot of times you can just walk into a courtroom and watch and see what's going on. And that provides a level of transparency to the process. That's really important that I realized after seeing how many of these hearings people weren't going to, and no one was seeing, and no one was witnessing what was happening with these stories. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the day in life of being an intern um, in Washington, D.C., specifically in the law field. So um, it starts really early, especially in journalism. Um, you have a lot of very quick turnarounds. So that meant that I received my assignment for the day, what hearings I was going to be sitting in on really early in the morning. Um, I would take the subway and I would be researching on the subway on my ride in because I a lot of times courts don't post the schedules um, for what's happening until the night before. And so that's another issue with public accountability, right, is you don't always know when hearings or trials are happening because things are constantly being rescheduled. And since defendants are oftentimes imprisoned, they're able to be brought in at pretty much a moment's notice, but the public doesn't always have that level of availability. And so it can be difficult to kind of make sure that you're attending the right hearings because schedules are only published the night before. Um, and so also another thing is usually computers or electronics of any type are forbidden in courtrooms unless you're a lawyer or you're working for the court system. Um, and so that's something that's really interesting as well. And this is something where if there was a high profile case that I was uh, covering, they would actually make you lock up your phone before you went inside the courtroom just to make sure that no one was recording, um, no one was saying anything that was getting out. And another thing is also that a lot of judges and lawyers will not necessarily appreciate that they know that their statements might be made public. And so that was definitely something that I learned that was very interesting was these are people's kind of their daily jobs, right? And they're obviously very impactful on the lives of everyday people, but it could definitely be a little disconcerting to have your every word at your job being put forward for public scrutiny. So one of the things that I also had to try and do was cultivate a good relationship with lawyers and with judges as much as possible so I could talk to them for my stories. And so just saying hi and just being friendly will really get you a long way. It's like any internship networking and being friendly are just super important. Um, and so again, it's a very fast paced day when you're a journalist. So during lunch, it was absolutely a working lunch. I would take notes and write up my notes um, for my morning hearings because I could only write them on paper because you couldn't take a laptop into the courtroom. 
But for our records, we had to have them stored digitally. So that meant that every note that I was writing down, I was writing twice, once when I was in the courtroom and once when I had to type it up for our records. And then in the afternoon after hearings had concluded, I would type up my story and I would send it in uh, to my editor. And then depending on what time hearings concluded that day, I would either get edits back at the end of the day or early the next day to complete. And so it's definitely a very fast paced day um, in courts and in journalism. Things happen very quickly. You need to get information very fast. There's very quick turnarounds. And so you kind of have to just be on top of things as much as possible. So um, I wanted to give some examples of the work that I published um, with DC Witness this past summer. Um, and so this was an example of a case that was really difficult um, because again, it's just a reminder that I think a lot of times in government and public policy work, if you're kind of removed from the work, it can be easy to forget that you have a real impact on people's lives. And a lot of times you are dealing with people in very vulnerable moments. And so you have to be very factual and um, present information as it is, but also be as kind um, as possible. And so one issue that we had in this case in particular was kind of an ethical dilemma where um, during testimony, someone had said something bad about the victim whose picture you can see here. And we had published that in our organization's paper. And um, the person came to us and said, we don't want that published. We don't want these negative things said about him. It's not respectful. Um, but ultimately the person who was accused of the homicide, um, she was released on most of the charges based on self-defense. And so the negative things that people had said about him were actually instrumental to the decision that the jury made. And so it's one of those things where you have to be as honest as possible and public transparency is really important because you want to respect the loved ones of victims, but you also have to know when to be honest. So it's one of those things where it's definitely a lot of tough calls in journalism specifically, um, but also in public policy, public service, you have to be as respectful to people's vulnerable moments as possible, but also do what you think is morally right. And that can be a tough call a lot of the time. Um, another piece that I worked on was actually a really interesting case. Um, it was a man who had been extradited from El Salvador. Um, he had been in El Salvador for almost 10 years at that time um, when he fled the United States after um, a shooting had occurred. And so it was really an interesting glimpse into the legal process because extradi extraditions don't happen that often. Um, and it was also one of those things where no one knew that this is what had happened. If you look on paper, because of the way that public records are kept in criminal justice systems, it doesn't say anything about extradition. All we knew was that this shooting had happened and that there was a hearing for it. And so then I went into this hearing not knowing anything about this man being extradited or having been away from the country for 10 years. And so it's, again, a testament to the fact that a lot of information about the criminal justice system can only be learned by actually sitting in on hearings and listening to them. And so that's why it's so important to have people who are kind of exposing this system to the public and making sure that people are really aware of what's happening. And so um, what I learned. So I learned definitely a lot of concrete skills um, through this internship. So I got a lot of experience with learning how to navigate public record systems, like I mentioned. Um, and so that can definitely be really difficult. A lot of these systems um, may have only been recently digitized. They're very outdated. And so it definitely can be very difficult work to research what's happening in these cases. And then also how to present complex legal information to the public can be very difficult. You have to distill down potentially complicated legal topics or really drawn out proceedings into just a couple of sentences to make it really readable while also staying true to what actually happened. And so writing concisely is absolutely, I think, one of the best skills that anyone in any field can have but especially when you're talking about the law and government being able to distill these complex um, processes down into like really concise statements is just a really great skill to have. And then some of the knowledge that I learned, um, again, I just wanna reemphasize that I worked in Washington DC in the criminal justice system. And obviously I think it's, you know, this hub for government and public policy, um, but, not a lot of light is always shone on the criminal justice system that's kind of at the local level in DC. Um, and so one of the things that I really realized was that 
you know, public perceptions of crime are often very different um, to what's actually happening. And so while I was at the organization, um, I did an investigative piece about sentencing guidelines in the DC area and how outdated they are. And what I actually discovered was that these, uh, these systems hadn't been updated in over 20 years, but also um, there were times where sentencing guidelines, which are the guidelines that judges are encouraged to consider when deciding a sentencing for a defendant, would contrast with mandatory minimums, which is when a certain crime has been committed um, by a certain individual, sometimes sentences are mandated for that specific crime. Um, people know a lot about mandatory minimums in the context of drugs, but a lot of times there's also mandatory minimums for gun possession and things like that. And so these guidelines would conflict what judges had to do and what they were told to do by an independent board and were encouraged to do would conflict. And so it shows that these systems are really outdated. And a lot of times local politicians, instead of trying to fix these systems from the root will kind of address what's happening after the fact. So the fact that people are getting incarcerated for longer periods of time then leads to people often committing more crimes when they get out and it just creates this cycle of violence. And so instead of addressing the root problem, you address the surface problems and then you're not really stopping that cycle of violence. And so I think definitely just gaining this exposure to the criminal justice system was really important to me personally um, because it showed me how difficult it can be to change these systems, but also how important public knowledge of these systems is when you actually want to try and change them. Because if you see these actions that politicians are doing that they say are trying to stop crime, that doesn't always fit with what might actually seem like it's going to stop crime when you're sitting in on these hearings and seeing what's happening with these cases. And so I think if you take one thing away from my presentation, I think I really want it to be that you should go and see what's happening in your community when it comes to criminal justice. It's very difficult, but also really important. And it gives you a lot of concrete skills. You can go and see if you're interested in going to law school. You can see what's happening, what these lawyers are saying, how they're acting, while also providing a service to your community in terms of being a court observer. Um, yeah, so that was my internship that I did this past summer. I gained a lot of really valuable insights about my community, about um, both the journalism fields as well as law, um, and I highly recommend it to anyone else. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, up next, we have Jackie, who will talk about her experience with the Sotomayor Judicial Internship. You can see my screen, right? Uh oh, I'm so sorry. I was, oh, okay. Let me do this again. <laughs> so sorry about this. Mm. Okay. Mm. Okay. All right, everyone can see my screen. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rebecca. It was lovely to hear your experience and you did an amazing job. And so thank you all for coming today and spending some time with us. I will talk about my, my experience today. And my name is Jackie Ochoa Acevedo. I am from Los Angeles, California. I'm a senior majoring in government and minoring in Spanish. I'm a first generation low income queer Latina and I'm just really happy to share like my experience with you all. And so let's begin. So if you know Justice Sotomayor, give me a thumbs up or a heart. But for those who don't know Justice Sotomayor, she is the first Hispanic to serve in the Supreme Court justice. She was appointed by President Obama in 2009. And she is from the from Bronx, New York, and such an inspiration. So I will uh and I yeah, I have like no words. I like admire her since like high school. And so with that being said, I, if you notice in the title, it says Sonia and Selena Sotomayor referring to her mom who, was, who passed away, but like that's her honoring her memory. And before I get started about giving you more insight about the program, I will review the mission and vision of the program. 
So the Sotomayor program seeks to cultivate and develop future leaders from underserved communities through judicial internships, educational experiences, and the resources necessary to achieve their professional goals. And the vision of the program is a legal profession reflecting America's diversity where all the confidence tools are encouraged to achieve their ambitions and contribute to a better and stronger democracy. So now I will give you an overview of the program from my perspective. And so you may ask yourself, Jackie, how did you find this opportunity? As I mentioned, I admire Justice Sotomayor. So I literally went to Google and I put Justice Sotomayor program and that's the first link that I got. And so it was very as simple as it, it was. It was just a Google search. So I was really glad I can find this opportunity and it opened well, in my cycle, it opened in November and the early admission to submit was in January. So I highly recommend that you submit it early on time and also ask your letters of recommendations and you have a personal statement. So keep in mind that it takes like a lot of work and, and have someone read your statements because it's very important to have a second eye. And when I submitted that, I then got an email for an interview around March. I won't give you a precise date, but for my interview, it was mid-March. For other folks, it was later March or like early April. And once you get admitted to the program, you will have this mandatory orientation in May, which you can either be in New York City in person, or because I was studying abroad in Spain at the time, I did it all throughout Zoom. And then fast forward to June, I started the judicial internship program. And then July is the LSAT bootcamp, and I will dig in more in the following sites. So for the first half of the program, I interned for Magistrate Judge Vera Scallon at EDNY. And as a Magistrate Judge, um, she oversees the initial uh, conferences of cases. So both parties come into the court and say, this is why I'm suing the defendant. And the judge will say, is this, does this have a legal basis on why it should move forward or not? And so I saw her see more of that. And so it was very interesting because it's like, okay, I don't know anything about the law, but just like the legal claims that were violated. And with that being said, like the judge was very welcoming and said, you can go to other judges um, trials because she didn't do trials um, specifically. So I had the opportunity to go sit around and other judges, meet other people. Every week we had lunches with the judges. So like they would pick a specific topic and they would talk to us about their experience and how they got to be a judge was very inspiring and to see how they got there. Because one thing that I really learned that no one's career law career path is straight. Like everyone has, it's not linear and it's okay. So that's something that I really enjoy learning. And for the judge, I created an Excel sheet to monetary the st status of the cases. So I was given a 800 load to determine if they were closed, open or pending. And so how I decided about that pending meant that it went to appeal, close, you know, like there's nothing to do and open that is just in the process of being decided what's going to happen with the case. And before she would hear these hearings, um, we were given cases and I would, you know, the cases are very dense and there's so many documents. So I had to prepare like a one, two page summary on what the parties were presenting tomorrow and what questions she should ask. And so... Finally, one of like the most rewarding experience was writing a background and facts summary judgment because you may ask yourself as an undergraduate, what can I do? I cannot recommend a legal, I can't recommend legal recommendations. And so that really helped me test my writing skills because again, the docket is so big that it's like, it's a lot of information that's being thrown at you. And so this is a project that I work with my supervisor, Max, who's a lovely law clerk for the judge. So that's something that I learned that the judges, you know, they're the one presenting to the parties, but it's the law clerks who like really have the judge, you know, present the information at an adequate time and like manage her caseload. So that was very rewarding. I was also in the room with law school students who were also entering for the judge. So it's very inspiring because I can ask, you know, questions that you can't really ask in Google and say like, okay, so what is law school real like? How do you study? And they even show me their notes, which was very like nice because it's like, I can't really have access to that. As I mentioned um, prior, I am first gen um, college student, so I don't have um, lawyers in my family. So it's very nice to have that one-on-one -on -one mentorship from law school students and also the law clerks and the judge. And moving on to the July aspect. So this is the LSAT bootcamp that you receive a course in Kaplan. 
and it is like a nine to five course, but sometimes around the weeks, we had law school visits to the schools you can see here in Columbia School, Fordham, and St. Um, John's University, where we also received workshops on how to make your personal statement stronger. As you all know, the, with the decision of affirmative action, this is changing how admissions look at applications. So it was very useful to know, like, what should I be saying? What can I not say? And another event that I really appreciated was the um, National Bar Association. So one of the bar associations that showed up were the Hispanic um, Bar Association. And I got to speak with a lawyer, you know, who looks like me and was like very inspiring because it's like, you know, you can make it in life. You just need to know your why and I keep going and reach out to your support system. And another event that we also did was the mock law class, which if you guys are in the Smith College Pre-Law Society, we brought, we brought this last semester and I feel like it was something that I have to share with folks because Personally, I've never been exposed to a legal case, so having um, a case to you know prepare for and then actually be got cold call was a wonderful experience because I feel like that's something that we all share, like the anxiety of being cold call in a class. And it's okay, it was low stakes and it was very wonderful. But the best, best event was actually meeting Justice Sotomayor. And I cannot, for legal reasons, I cannot show you a picture but it was so wonderful to meet her in person. She shook everyone's hand. She took a picture with us. It was really quite re remarkable. I left that day. I was just like, I cannot believe I'm in the same room as Justice Sotomayor. And it was just a wonderful experience because you see someone who is at the highest court making it, making a name for herself, for her community. But it was just something that I will forever cherish in my life. And unfortunately, I can't share those pictures. But if you are interested in the program, like you can definitely meet her and you can ask questions and it's a really great program. And you may wonder how does Smith help me with this, um, how, how to get to this program. And I feel like my major as a government major, I came into Smith knowing that I had to work twice as hard because I attended public education school from K to 12. So my writing skills were not there. And so I really, I'm appreciative of like learning, learning how to write and think critically and, and improve my research skills. And I also did the Jean Picker in Washington program in fall of 2022, which really like um helped me so much, and not just in my like professional career development, but also in my academics. And I took the Washington seminar in government, and it was a very rewarding experience because during the day I was interning for Senator Elizabeth Warren as one of her legislative intern. And during the evenings, we would attend class and learn more about how Congress works and also write a research paper, which was, you know, it's a lot to handle, but it really helps you prepare for what the real world experience is like. You know, you may come thinking to work one day, like, okay, I'm going to do this set of tasks. But it's something that I learned with this program is that, you know, you have to be fast on your feet because I saw that the judge would ask um, the parties to please submit this document by the end of the day. So I imagine for those like plaintiffs and defendants counsel, they have to really like abide by her deadlines because, you know, if they don't submit those documents on time, it really hurts their case. And so with this opportunity to, from going from the picker program and seeing how the legislative branch works and how they make laws and now experiencing how the law affects communities, mostly communities of color, and it really comes down to the judge to decide what happens. It's very fruitful and like a very, a work that is needed to be done. And so, oh, so sorry. And with that being said, this reaffirmed my decision to attend law school. I, you know, imposter syndrome comes in and you may question like myself, like, am I even worth it? But with this experience, it really gave me the opportunity to tell myself like, Yes, like I should go to law school because um, the legal field does not diverse itself. And I've noticed that, you know, we need uh, uh, people of color need to take up these spaces. And one of the cases that has left a mark in my experience with this program was a pro se litigant case. A pro se litigant is someone who's representing themselves because they cannot afford an attorney to present them in a case. And it was very impactful in a way because you see that they have a meaningful case that they're bringing to the court and you know they don't know the law. And so that can be some discrepancies, but I can attest that at least my judge took the time to explain what the legal proceeding meant and any questions that they had. 
although I spoke with some judges and some lawyers and like even law students, and they said that this is not the same case in all courts of the United States, some judges would not take the time to explain that. And, you know, that's something that's out of our control. But seeing those moments and being in those spaces, it allowed me to think, okay, I want to help my community, but not just my community. I want to help all communities. So another thing I learned is to remember your why, because that would take you a long way in your life. You know, because even at Smith, you were like, oh, I'm not good enough. And you get this imposter syndrome. But no, just ignore the noises. You got this. And if I can do it, I feel like anyone can do it. And yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to hear me speak about my experience. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was wonderful. Um, and our third presenter is Koki. Hi, everyone. Um, Rebecca and Jackie, that was awesome. I feel very lucky to be in your company um, and learn about your ex amazing experiences. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. I hope everyone can see it. All good? Okay, perfect. So hi, everyone. My name is Koki Kapoor. I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently a junior at Smith, majoring in Gov and quantitative economics. Um, this past year, I uh, was actually a participant in the Picker program as well. Um, and it's offered by the Gov Department at Smith and it allows you to pursue internship opportunities over the summer and the fall while also taking classes. So it's a big uh, responsibility, you work on an independent research project. So it's kind of your first take at adulting, like Jackie said, um, and it was a very fruitful experience. So for why I'm here today, I'm talking about my summer internship experience. Um, I worked as a campaign research intern with Dynamic Strategy Research Group, um, and I will, that's my official title, but it's a small team. So I had the opportunity to wear multiple hats and do all kinds of work. Uh, so just a little bit about the firm itself. Um, it's based out of New York City. Uh, they are a political fundraising and public affairs firm. Um, they work primarily for Democrats and champion progressive causes. It was founded in 2011 by people that have worked on the Clinton campaigns um, and Al Gore's campaign, et cetera. Um, and so they have a lot of experience. And because it's such a small team, I got to work with these very um, experienced people very closely, and that's something that I will treasure forever. Um, so in terms of what the firm does, we work across a spectrum of Democrats. So that goes from candidates to donors. That means elected officials at the state and federal level, so city, state, federal levels. Uh, we work on their campaigns. We work with political action committees. Uh, we work with donors as well. So that means like, um, coming up with development strategies for how donors can maximize their giving power um, while also working on fundraising side and organizing events for elected officials, um, which is especially important with 2024 coming up. Um, and we also work with organizations. So yeah, these are some examples of our clients. You can see here, we have House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. We have Congressman Gregory Meeks. Uh, we also have Gov Governor Kathy Hochul of New York and Jennifer Rajkumar, who's a state assemblywoman from New York. Um, and she's a personal inspiration of mine because she's also South Asian and she's just a firecracker. Her campaign uh, finance numbers are crazy through the roof. Everyone loves her. So, and I hadn't heard about her before this internship. So it was, that was awesome. We also worked, like I said, with um, committees. So with the Congressional Black, Black Caucus, as well as the Bronx Democratic um, Committee. Uh, so in terms of my response, well, first I'll talk a little bit about how I got the internship. Um, it's pretty hard as part of the Picker program to find an internship in DC. It's a long process um, because the city is so transient. People are coming in and out of jobs and internships. So it's a long process. And I was very lucky to ultimately find this opportunity. It was remote. Um, but I actually got it through, got an in through my friend Ali Tutai, who is a fellow Smithy. She spoke at the business finance and consulting panel, and she worked at Dynamic the summer before this one. 
Um, and so that was just another awesome moment of Smithy's helping Smithy's. And so I just wanted to give her a quick shout out. Um, so I applied and gave my cover letter. Uh, I had a quick interview and they were like, you're in. And I started the next day. Um, like I said, it's a small team. So the onboarding, it was all very quick. Um, and one of my first responsibilities was actually, so I, basically I worked on the electoral side, the donor side and doing research, because like I said, we work at the intersection of like what elected officials need as well as what donors need. Um, so I did a bunch of phone banking for the New York primary that happened in June. Um, one of our candidates that I was phone banking for was County Legislator Chris Johnson, who won. And I did about 400 calls. Um, as somebody who is kind of reserved, it was definitely hard. Um, but I think as somebody who wants to get into the field of government and uh, public policy, it's a really important experience to have because I think um, when we think when we learn about elections and voting in an academic setting, it often happens in a vacuum. Um, when in reality, it's the complete opposite of that. It's all about the people. And so phone banking really allowed me to see the effect of what I was learning about in class. Uh, for example, later on in the Picker program, we took a seminar on polarization. And so I was able to connect the dots between the behavior of people on the phone when the moment I mentioned the word Democrat, I would the call would get cut. Um, and I hadn't even gotten to a policy stance yet. And then eventually in the in my class later, I learned that that's a form of effective polarization. And so it was a really great opportunity for me to connect the dots between my learning and what is actually going on in the real world. Um, I also um, created a database tracking in district donors, which I'll talk about a little later. I donate, I organized a bunch of fundraisers for city and federal level officials. Um, I learned a lot of the know-how about political fundraising on the donor side, how the importance of updating contact information, um, like coursing through databases and uh, through the internet. They loved that I was 20 years old because I was pretty good at that part. Um, and also doing um, campaign finance research and competitor analysis um, and so, for example, one day I got like an email from my boss that um, we have this, we've heard like through the grapevine that Assembly District 18 is going to open up, like the seat is going to open up. And so we need you to do all of this kind of research. So I got really integrated into the political world and how so much stuff happens through word of mouth and through rumors before they actually become news stories. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, just a little more about two of like the specific things I did. Um, I worked a lot on creating a database for fund matching changes. So basically over the past couple of years, the state of New York has implemented a new fund matching system, um, wherein the co contribution level to candidates um, has changed. So basically what happens is the election committee and the state will match a certain amount um, of donation that a resident can give. So since those numbers have changed, it's very important that we identify donors whose contributions can qualify to be matched so that we ensure that we meet the thresholds to re receive the matching funds from the state, because that's really good for campaigns. More money in a campaign usually means more success for better or for worse. Um, and so I basically had a spreadsheet of a list of donors who had donated to our campaigns. I had their addresses and I had the district map. And basically it was tedious work because it was about 2,500 people overall that I did this for. I would go into the district match, look up their address and find if their fund, if their donations qualified or not. Um, and then at the same time, there's also a couple of days ago, you may have seen in the news that um, the New York congressional map has changed a little this year, it's been redistricted and there is a slight Democrat leaning this time. Um, and so because of that, I had to also look, compare zip code maps and existing as map, assembly district and state Senate district maps and see what had changed and if there were new zip codes that qualified. So I was really integrated into like gerrymandering and seeing how redistricting works. Um, and 
it was interesting for me because at the end of the day, I was an intern um, and I was just looking at these maps, looking at zip codes and saying, okay, this fits within these lines. And so that's kind of how it's going to work. Um, and it was a little jarring because it felt like there was so much power in my hands for a second. Um, and so I think when we think about how gerrymandering dispor disproportionately affects um, people of color and how um, the resources that they get during the electoral process and how they're franchised, um, I think it's very important to think about who we give power to. Um, and so, yeah, that was a great experience that I had. And then in terms of organizing fundraising um, events themselves, uh, this is a poster that I made for an event that I helped organize for the Bronx Democratic County Committee. Um, it was celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Um, and this was great because I got to work with Darren, who's one of the co-founders of the firm. And he kind of taught me about how um, fundraising works and basically how to target people, how to um, make sure that we're always in communication, which I think is an important networking skill as well that I will take into the world with me. But I was told that every year, honestly, any holiday, you should keep in touch with the people that are important for your cause um, and ensure um, that they remember you and they remember um, what you need. And also you remind them of what you can provide them with. Um, and so, and I also learned a lot about looking at donation amounts and seeing how to potentially get people to donate more um, and kind of how to categorize donors in that sense. Um, and then ultimately, um, in terms of like my takeaways from the experience, it was great to have practical campaign experience while also learning a lot about like quantitative skills, et cetera. Um, through all of the data work that I did, I also got to compare campaign finances across um, different campaigns. And so that was very cool to see um, how unupdated some of the websites are <laughs> for the New York election board. Um, and further, I on the donor side, I worked with a lot of high net worth individual donors, and it was interesting to see the role that they play in the political world that often goes unnoticed. Like we talk a lot about the revolving door between um, Washington DC and Wall Street. Um, and so especially working with a firm based out of New York where there's so much, uh, where so many corporations and real estate tycoons live. And these are often people donating huge amounts of money to our elected officials. It was interesting to see those worlds collide. Um, and eventually um, in the fall, this experience really prepared me for my time at the National Women's Political Caucus, where I also did a lot of work um, on the campaign side, but this time vetting female candidates, um, pro-choice female candidates and fundraising for them and coming up with development strategies as well. So overall, it was a really great experience. And um, I will be returning to DC this summer. So I think all in all, um, it was very positive for me. Uh, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Koki, and thank you all for those incredible presentations and for sharing your experiences with all of us. Um, with the time that we have left, we will open it up for questions from the audience. If you could please put them in the chat and then I will share them with our panelists. Um, I did get a question that asked, what part of your internships pushed you outside of your comfort zone? Who wants to jump in first? Okay, Jackie, you're it. Great. <laughs> I think for me is like presenting to the judge because you are talking to this person who's so knowledgeable and has so much experience and like just giving her a brief um, summary of the case. And it's just like, oh, am I doing a good job? So it's like, it's that power dynamic. But 
I, at least for my judge, she was like very welcoming and she would always question me. What do you think about this case? Like after the um, parties left and what, how would you go about it? And I was like, it really pushed me to think critically and because she has to be impartial. And so she would throw questions at me and I'd be like, okay, I think this is like great, great for me just because I can see double sides of the coin, but also have a conversation with a judge. And I feel like just speaking to someone who has so much knowledge was something that um, really helped me like um, grow as a person. That's a great answer. Rebecca, were you about to jump in before I called up Jackie? Yeah. Oh, no, I was going to say something similar. I think like talking to um, people who are just very experienced and like very knowledgeable in their fields can be really intimidating, especially if, you know, a lot of internships will kind of throw you like right in the deep end um, and you kind of have to like find your own way. Um, and so you have to figure out how to talk with these people and like be seen not as their equal, but as someone who can like hold your own in a conversation with them. Um, and so a lot of it is kind of almost like improv like you're not going to know the answer to everything. You're not always going to know the right questions to ask, but just like knowing that it's okay to mess up because that's always, it's always very difficult. Cause especially if you're an intern, it's like, you don't want to mess up. You feel like, you know, so many other people tried to get this opportunity. You're so lucky to get it. And you have to like prove that you earned it, except you did earn it. Like you went through the interview process, you went through everything. And so it can be difficult to remember that you really like earned your spot and you're doing important work and you're allowed to take up space. That's great. Koki, we have another question. Did you want to jump in on this one before we move on? Um, yeah, I mean, I was also going to uh, jump off of that and say that for me, it was kind of hard initially to ask for help because it was such a small team. I felt like the only person I could ask help to ask for help from was the boss. Um, so there wasn't like a senior intern above me and I was like, oh, this is a really long email with a lot of questions. Um, and it feels like maybe I should know some of this, but it's also my, a week in. And so kind of understanding that that's okay. Um, I think communication is like the biggest learning um, experience for me from this internship in general, yeah. That's great, thank you all. The question we got in the chat just now is how has gender affected your experiences in the world of government and or law? Um, I can jump in even though I just spoke. <laughs> um, but over the uh, summer when I was with Dynamic, I was the only girl on the team. And then I went over to the National Women's Political Caucus where there was not a single um, non-female identifying person as part of the team. So I got kind of got to experience both of those things. And I will say that during the summer, it did, at moments I would be reminded on like team meetings or team calls when they would be talking about things that I was the only um, girl in the room and I was also the youngest person there. And so there's definitely an interesting dynamic that you have to navigate being like um, just that young and being a woman for me personally, that is something that I've learned that I have to get used to um, sometimes because it will not always be the case that you will go on to like the National Women's Political Caucus. So um, most like workplaces are not going to have that kind of environment. So that it, it was um, interesting, but it also helped. It, I feel like it gives you a unique lens on um, the world and the work that you do, which is especially important in the field of government. So, yeah. Great answer. Rebecca, think, Jack. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, I think at least in law, I think there's a lot of kind of like solidarity with women lawyers and wanting to have more women in law and I think that's true of like also just a lot of like marginalized groups as well like people want to see you succeed and they know how difficult becoming a lawyer can be and so like when I was there like I wasn't even involved with the lawyers that I was talking to but they were like oh do you want to go to law school like do you want tips like do you want to talk through it with me and like these were people who I didn't even really know and so I think that like there is a sense of solidarity there because people know that it's difficult and they've struggled and that's not to say that like gender isn't going to challenge you or that like it's 
easy necessarily, but that like there is a lot of times a support system for you in certain places and it's not going to be there for everyone and it's not going to be there in every internship and it's not going to be there in every organization, but it is in a lot of places if you're able to find it. I think everyone pretty much covered how I felt, but I feel like with this experience, something that I visibly saw that the legal, there's a big, huge gap with who's a, who's, who's lawyers. It's like, why cis men? And then that gap just gets like, there's a, there's a start of fake, start, oh, so sorry. There's like, a, there's such just gaps in like your identity. So if you're a person of color, like it just gets, I would say worse in the legal field. So like, reminding myself that when the imposter syndrome would kick in I'm like okay you know I have this is my right like I earned my spot here and I should voice my concerns and that's all you need to remember like you're valuable if you got the opportunity it's because you are deserving and as like my peers mentioned like don't ever doubt it because they want they chose you for a reason so just keep those things in mind and you will be very successful. That is great. We did have other questions in the chat, but we are at time. Um, so if people reach out to you directly about your internship, is that okay? Yes. Okay, great. So with that, we will conclude today's Smith in the World panel. Thank you all again um, for joining us and thank you to our wonderful panelists. I would also like to extend a huge thank you to Emily Beaudry for organizing this conference series and for her commitment to the experience, experiential learning of our Smithies. I hope you enjoyed this session as much as I did. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Oh, and thank you, Emily. Questions can come to Lazarus, Lazarus at smith.edu. Great, thank you so much. <laughs>